exciting testimonies coming from God's people. I should just skip the sermon today. Wow, you guys have preached it already. A, few, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Martel and I stood outside and talked about his situation and uh, God is working in his life and of course in your wife's life as well. Keep praying for them and look forward to the day when she does come through that door and uh, we will certainly shout glory down as she does. Amen. Thank you for praying for me as I travel to the States for a week. Um, I appreciate your prayerful support. Um, I'm going to teach from Acts chapter 8 today. If you want to turn with me, Acts chapter 8, <clears throat> verses 9 through 25, I'm going to talk about the other Simon. Most of us know who Simon Peter is, and this is the other Simon, one of the others. It's a pretty common name, but we're going to talk about a different Simon today. Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 25. Verses 9 through 25. Welcome to all of you from here for the first time, all the way from South Carolina. Natasha and I were going, ah, southern folks, makes us homesick. Yeah. Let's read. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and explained, this man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip, now notice the very first word of that sentence, but when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Not a good move. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. And in another version, and this is actually close to the Greek, Peter says, To hell with you and your money. I know it sounds funny, but that's what the Greek almost literally says. I know it sounds like today kind of a slang, but that's what he's saying. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Maybe he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon, not Peter, Simon the magician, the sorcerer, answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please open up our hearts and our minds to receive your word. Father, change our lives today. Don't let us go out of here the same way we came in. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I like these stories of little-known characters in the Bible. We can learn so much about what's going on. I have a friend who has an unbelievable ability to bargain. This lady 
can get a BMW at cost. She is unreal. She's got a lot of options, I guess. She, she thinks, well, there's a BMW on that, a dealer on that side of town and one on that side of town, so, you know, I can go over there and bargain with these people and tell them what I want the car for, and if they don't give it to me, I'm going to go over there and get one. She's got this real ability to do this, and she usually gets the car or the thing at what, whatever because of her ability to bargain. She's got that talent. I'd like to ask you, do you and I bargain with God? Do we? Why do, if we do, why do we try and make deals with God? You know, that's what Simon the magician was doing. He was trying to bargain with God. He was trying to make a deal. Trying to get something more than he already had. Well, before we look at Simon, let's, look, let's set the stage. Where is this happening? Who's involved? This text in Acts is taking place in a, an area called Samaria. Now that's kind of in the northeast corner of Israel, kind of close to the sea, uh, kind of like northern California, Oregon would be close to the Pacific Ocean, but over in that area. Now, Philip is there preaching the gospel. Why is he there preaching the gospel? It's very interesting. You should read a, a few verses back. And you see, what happened was the church was being persecuted. So Philip, not the apostle Philip, the deacon Philip, not a preacher, not a pastor, not an apostle, a deacon, a coordinator, a lay leader in the church, a cleaner of tables. Well, he was like, that's what he was commissioned to do, clean the tables so that the apostles could do the work of ministry. Philip, that guy, escaped the persecution. They were all sitting around Jerusalem. God allowed persecution to, came, to come, and everybody ran away from persecution. Philip began preaching the word in Samaria, and Samaria was getting saved. And that's what happened. That's what was happening in this place where evil, where demons, where witchcraft was prevalent, where this guy Simon, this witch, this guy, was dominating the people of the area. Now this guy is historically powerful. Non-Christian documents talk about this guy Simon. That's how powerful he was. There's, they've actually found a statue that was erected to this guy. That's how big and powerful he was in Samaria. Now revival is happening in Samaria. Now, we have to understand who's there. We've got Simon, the sorcerer, the magician, the witch, whatever you want to call him, this powerful man who's using power to entrap people, to control people, to get money from people. And then we'll, later on we'll have Simon Peter come into the mix, a different Simon. And we want to talk about the Holy Spirit. So today I want to talk about the other Simon, Simon the witch. Then we want to look at what happens when Simon meets Simon. We're going to really get confused with these two Simons. I'll call him Peter later. And then we want to close by looking at the near fatal mistake of bargaining with God. It is not a very good thing to do. Well, who was this guy named Simon the magician? Well, if we look at our text, we can see, basically, this guy was a powerful man. Simon. He practiced sorcery in the city, witchcraft, control, power for the sake of entrapping people for your own goods, your own purposes. Not to be helpful, although putting on a front to be helpful in order to get more people to follow you. He amazed all the people of Samaria. He was well known throughout the whole region. Not only that, but he was quick to tell others how great he was. This is who Simon was. He had trickery. He had deception. He had magic to get all this 
accomplished. That's how he did it. And it wasn't just the poor people. It wasn't just the um, unintelligent. It wasn't just people in the civilian sector. It was people in government. People high and low, the Bible says, who gave him their attention. This guy had all people from all classes in trap. And we know that from history, non-Christian documents as well. This guy was a big guy. Even in government circles, he was well known. They have found documents detailing this fellow's life. He was so big, so powerful, that they began to call him the great power. The great power. And that's where uh, he gets his, his name, Simon, uh, Simon Magus, or Simon Magus. Magus means great power. And they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. So Samario basically was under the control of this guy. Wherever he said they believed, wherever he went, they would go. He had them under his thumb. A kind of witchcraft. Any kind of power that you have over someone else for personal gain basically is witchcraft, folks basically what it is. And that's what he was doing. And then in verse 12, something wonderful happens to Samaria and something not so good for Simon the sorcerer. Philip came into town and he was preaching the gospel and lives were being changed. Lives were going over to the other side, not by any deception, not by any trickery, but by the power of God. Philip was there preaching the gospel and lives were being changed. Men and women, good news of the kingdom of God. Men and women were getting saved, they were getting baptized, and Simon was watching this going, whoa, this is good. And this is not so good. Maybe Simon was trying to tell himself, hey, this is a good thing. And even Simon himself, the Bible tells us, Simon himself believed and was baptized. Now the key is, look at that verse. Look at the end of the second part of chapter 13. Simon belie himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip, the evangelist, everywhere. Why did he follow Philip? We can see after the comma. He was astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. And I'm astonished by those things too, but I tend to believe that Simon Magus was going, okay, now, I've been doing all these miracles. I've been doing magic. I can't do this kind of magic. I'm going to follow this guy around and see if I can learn something. Now, was he doing it for the glory of God? I don't think so. I don't usually ask you to turn a lot when I teach, but I'm going to ask you to turn with me to John chapter 2 for a second. John chapter 2, and I'll tell you the verse number in a minute. I didn't write it down. I think it's verse 22 and following. Okay, verses 23 and following. Now, is this the first time that we have seen people like Simon since Jesus has been on earth or since even the beginning of time? But let's look at verses 23 through 25. And this is, uh, it says, now while he, we're talking about Jesus, while Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. Very good, right? Cool, wonderful, good stuff, excellent. Let's look at the next verse. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He didn't need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man, or he knew what was in a man's heart. And I kind of tend to believe that's what happened to Simon here. Simon said, sure, I'll believe. 
I'll follow you wherever I go so I can get my hands on some of those magic tricks. I'm not so sure that Simon actually in his heart really, really believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and had committed to him his whole life. I think he was struggling. As Philip walked around and as his former disciples, as Simon's former followers were now following Jesus, there was something stirring inside of Simon and it wasn't good. Okay, now he's taking my followers. Now where's my income going to come from? Um, what's going on? There was a struggle going on. Everybody here knows what a foxhole conversion is, right? Foxhole conversion is when people go to war, and not so much anymore, but they used to, when the wars were in Europe and other places, people would dig holes to hide from the bullet rounds and let them go over their head. And as the bullet rounds were going over, they would begin to bargain with God. Someone wrote, someone named William T. Cummings wrote, there are no atheists in foxholes. While crouched in a trench with bullets zinging overhead, even the most reluctant heart begins to bargain with God, just in case God might exist. And this is the kind of conversation that goes on. God, if you only get out of, get me out of this alive, I'll... But foxhole faith rarely lasts very long. It doesn't last too long. When the crisis passes, thoughts of God recede into the background. Right? Let me ask you something. Are you closer to God when everything's going good? Or when you're... Reading James chapter 1, oh God. Uh, oh, okay. What? When we're facing our trials, we get close to God. Whether you're an atheist or a believer, sometimes the trial draws us into close contact with God. But to be converted under such circumstances rarely lasts. God is mostly there for emergencies. And I think this is what Simon the Magician was going through. He was seeing his converts, his followers, now converted to the real God, to the real great power. He was losing his people. He jumps in and says, hey, I'll get saved. Hey, baptize me too. And the elders at Jerusalem heard about what was going on in Samaria. And they sent another Simon. They sent Simon Peter, the disciple of Jesus, the apostle, and John to go down there and add some teaching because, you know, I think they're the elders of the church at the time and they've got this, this deacon down there who's doing a great job, but he goes in to encourage. They, these two people come in to do some encouraging, do some teaching, do some praying to support their brother in the Lord and and to just enjoy the revival that's there. So Peter and John had a motivation too. Simon the magician had motivation, but Simon Peter had another one. Simon Peter's motivation was to go to Samaria and glorify God at all costs. No matter what, they were going there to lift up the name of Jesus. They were going there to pray for other people. They were not going there for their own selfish motives to just get in on the glory like Simon the magician was had nothing to do with them. How many times have we heard in this church people being encouraged, people encouraging one another, people testifying, finally understanding, hey, it's not about me. It's not about me. And when we learn that, when we hear that, we begin to grow, God begins to change us, and lives around us begin to change as well. We have to learn that it's not about me. Simon Peter didn't learn that the easy way. If you go back and study the Gospels, you'll find that Peter went through it with Jesus time and time again before he learned, it's not about me. Now he's in Jerusalem. The elders send him to Samaria and say, go over there and support Philip, and he's gone in a heartbeat because he knows it's not about me. Well, what happens when he gets there and Simon meets Simon? 
interesting little clash of characters. Well, Simon and John are busy with Philip and they begin to pray. Verse 14 and 15, one of the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. I like the way Luke says Samaria had accepted the word of God. You know there were some people getting saved. He didn't say some people. Samaria was getting saved. I mean, there was not enough room for these people to kneel down anymore. They were getting saved. They sent Peter and John to Philip and whoever was already there. And when they arrived, what did they begin to do right away? They began to pray. They began to pray. We say it again. They began to pray for them. Now, you need to be very careful. We need to take notice that when God sends revival to a place, it's not because of the teaching, it's not because of the preaching, it's because people are praying. When Jesus went into the temple and began to clean the place out, what did he say? He said, this is going to, this, don't do this in my father's house because it's a place of preaching. Is that what he said? No, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer. And that's what's happening here. When Peter and John got there, and it, Verse 15, when they arrived, they prayed for them. They prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, they had simply been baptized into the name of Jesus. Now, <clears throat> in verse 17 and 18, we're going to see something happen that is really going to get Simon's attention. And I'm going to explain to you what I think is happening here, and most commentators agree. So it won't be too radical for you, I think. The Holy Spirit hadn't come on them. Peter and John placed their hands on these new believers and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, Simon, the magician, you know, he was following Philip around, seeing all these miracles and perhaps thinking of ways he could get in on some of this. And he's thinking about profit. They're thinking about the glory of God when Philip and John laid their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. Now, just, just as a little kind of side note for teaching purposes, <clears throat> how did Simon know that they had received the Holy Spirit? How did they know? Well, I'll tell you what I th why I think they know is because they began to speak with other tongues. Three other times in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, when people were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to worship God in an unknown language. And perhaps this is what Simon saw. Simon the magician saw this and he went, whoa, these guys are completely surrendered to God. They're worshiping God in a language they've not been taught. Give me some of that power. I want that. Let me get in on this. Not a good move, Simon. Not a good move. Now, Simon Peter didn't like this at all. Simon meets Simon. And here's what Simon said. Give me this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hand, who's getting the glory here? Everyone on whom I lay my hand may receive the Holy Spirit. Now that old crusty fisherman who's messed it up so many times himself was not a, even a little hesitant to get in Simon the Magician's face and say, to hell with you and your money. May your money perish with you. And perish means in hell because you thought you could buy the gift of God? Are you crazy, man? Perhaps Simon the magician should have done his homework. Three chapters earlier, Acts chapter 5, Simon Peter is with a group of believers. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through um, 6 or 7. Now, if Simon the magician would have known this, maybe he'd have kept his mouth shut. 
Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also, bought, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, Peter, Simon Peter, said, Ananias, you idiot. Now, he didn't say it like that, but... How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept yourself for yourself some of the money that you received for the land? Didn't, I, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? Nobody forced you to go and do this. And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Great fear seized all who heard what had happened. And then also his wife... Um, about three hours later, his wife came in, did the same thing, and she said, here's the price. And Peter said, you lied to God too? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And she fell down and died. She died too. Now, Simon the sorcerer, Simon the magician, had known not to bargain with God for cash. I wonder if he'd have made such a stupid mistake. But Peter was not tolerant of Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira, and he was not at all tolerant with Simon. Simon believed that God could be bought with money. Peter was horrified. Peter saw this man caught up in sin and evil and was just intolerant. Now, I wonder, was Simon so full of himself still after hearing Peter that he was still bargaining with God? You know, you have to read it carefully there. Does it look like he has changed? He was saying, Peter, pray so that pray for me so that none of what you said would happen. But there's no indication that he really repented. I don't know. I don't know. We just have to kind of speculate or wonder. I hope that he woke up and repented because we don't have a, uh, anything in the text that says he died as Ananias and Sapphira did. But Simon the sorcerer was in trouble. The bargain had not gone as he had planned. <laughs> you can't bargain with God, folks. So what can we learn from Simon? This man who would try to bargain with God for power, the one, this Simon, tried to make God to be who he wanted God to be. He wanted to use the power of the Holy Spirit for his own purposes, not to glorify God. What can we learn? Do we as Christians, I asked you earlier, do we as Christians sometimes bargain with God? I believe we do. God, if my promotion comes through, I'll... God, if I win the lottery, I will give so much money to the church. That church will never go broke. God, if I can just have this job, if I can get married to that person, we barter... We haggle the same way Simon did. God, if you'll just save my child. What do we usually, other than money, want from God? The right job? Understandable. Good health? I understand. Good relationships? I know that. Promotions? Okay. No problem. But we can't fit God into the little picture we have of him. God is God. We bargain with God because we want God to fit into our box, our thoughts of who he should be. It's like we take God out of our pocket. We ask him to perform. <laughs> do this for me, God. He's like our pet. Good God. Thanks, God. You did exactly what I wanted you to. And we put him back in our pocket when we're done. Now listen to me. It's okay to ask for God for things. God encourages us. The Bible encourages us to ask. To knock. 
to seek, to go to God for those things you need that will glorify God. It's the attitude with which we ask that can cause our downfall. The motives behind our request are the key. It wasn't an evil thing that Simon asked. I want the Holy Spirit. But it was his motives that were his downfall. This week, as you pray to God, ask him to show you your true motivations for what you're asking for. Pray in a way that reflects who God is, not who you want him to be and not what you want from him. Just pray in a way that shows you who God is. How many in here knows who Charles Haddon Spurgeon is? Charles Haddon Spurgeon is one of the great preachers of all time. The Prince of Preachers, he was called. Wonderful pastor. By the age of 16, he was preaching. By the age of 25, he had a 50,000-seat auditorium. 50,000-seat auditorium that was not big enough. It was never big enough. And he traveled all over Europe to preach. At the same time that Spurgeon was popular, there was another guy that was popular named P.T. Barnum. Anybody know who P.T. Barnum was? Yeah, he was a great circus builder, tent builder, and uh, prominent circus owner. Filthy rich man, P.T. Barnum, heard about Spurgeon and the great crowds coming out to hear him. He sent Spurgeon a telegram with an offer of a large sum of money to come and preach in his circus tents. And P.T. Barnum's motive was that God would be glorified? Nah. He wanted to charge admission. Spurgeon sent a very short reply, and here it is. Dear Mr. Barnum, you'll find my answer in Acts chapter 8, verse 20. Shall I read that for you? May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Let's not bargain with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that your entire word is true and good to teach us, to encourage us, to correct us, to lead us on the right path, Lord. Lord, let us check out our motivations. Let us pray with a right heart, a pure heart, Father, we know, we are sure and secure in our faith. Lord, as we go forth and walk with you and for your glory, Lord, keep us true to your word. Let our attitude be as the attitude of Christ, ever seeking to glorify your name. Let us not try to put you in a small box, but let us walk and pray and live for who you are as your word guides us and teaches us who you really are. We ask all these things and we pray them in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming. We have some fellowship downstairs.